Welcome to News in Context. I'm Gina Valeria. In this episode, we explore the sharp increase in fentanyl deaths across the country, including in San Francisco and the Bay Area, which had thus far had great success in combating the opioid epidemic. My guest is Dr. Philip Coffin, Director of Substance Use Research at the San Francisco Department of Public Health, who discusses how fentanyl is different than other opioids and what we can do to mitigate its impact. I'm very thankful for you talking with me today because this is an important issue and it's affecting San Francisco. Um, It's something I think we've heard a lot about in other parts of the country, but San Francisco is being affected. Can you talk a little bit about the current state of the situation in San Francisco? So we now have sort of a new baseline where fentanyl is the primary cause of overdose deaths, responsible for around 90% of our opioid overdose deaths in the city. This has been connected to a, a really profound increase in the number of people dying each year from drug overdose. We've gone from around 200 a year to close to 700 a year. Wow. Is this something that you saw coming? Is this something that you expected based on what was happening in other parts of the country or based on San Francisco's uh, general makeup? Yes. We all saw this coming and we're just kind of waiting for the other shoe to drop or hoping, hoping that it wouldn't or that we would get more time. When this started hitting the eastern half of the country, as well as Vancouver, basically all the powder heroin areas were a black tar area for heroin. Um, All the powder heroin areas were hit with this starting in general, probably around 2014. And they all saw several fold increases in overdose death as fentanyl came to dominate the market. And we didn't see fentanyl come to dominate the market out here until really probably 2018, 19 was when it really started to happen and full bore in 2020. We were protected a little bit probably because the heroin supply is different in this part of the country compared to the powder areas. I'd love to dive a little bit into that. How does a place become a powder heroin area versus a black tar? It has to do with where the heroin comes from. For the western half of the country, the heroin comes from Mexico and it is trafficked as black tar heroin, which is kind of a product that's kind of halfway between uh, opium and heroin. It's not just heroin. It's got a lot of other opioids in it. It's sort of not completely processed into heroin. And that's just been the nature of how heroin has been trafficked in the western half of the country for several decades now. In the eastern half of the country, the heroin is coming mostly from Colombia and maybe some from Asia. And then Vancouver as well, the heroin is coming from Asia and it's not coming from Mexico, even though it's on the western seaboard. So you can travel right up through Washington and as you approach the border, it's still black tar and you go to the other side of the border and it's powder. That is interesting. The supply chains and the and the pathways. Yeah, and that has to do with the gangs that are controlling the trafficking as opposed to border control. Is there a practical difference in powder versus black tar versus maybe other forms in how it affects someone? There is a little bit. I think somebody who uses black tar might say it, it's a, more of a holistic uh, experience. And when somebody's using heroin that's powder, they're getting more of a, more of a sharp high. And then as you move to fentanyl, it's sort of an even sharper, more synthetic high. So if you were thinking of your opioids from sort of the most natural and kind of holistic experience, you'd start with opium. And as you move towards heroin, you'd stop at black tar and then you'd get to powder heroin and then you get into your synthetics. And fentanyl is just, it's so addictive and the high is so great. Is that, is that what's going on? Yeah, it's, it's so potent that you know, somebody who's transitioned to using fentanyl, if they go and use heroin, it feels like water. Okay, so here we are in San Francisco and black tar is is our issue. How did this become a crisis here in San Francisco or in the Bay Area? So first off, I, I think it's always important to think a little bit about the, the history over the last 20 years, which was we somehow managed to revert an increase in overdose death in San Francisco 
during the first two opioid crises. So the prescription opioid crisis, which we know affected the city, and then the heroin crisis as we cut back on prescribing opioids. And during that entire time period, our best estimates suggest that we had about a threefold increase in the number of people who inject drugs in the city, and yet no increase in mortality over that period. So that was really exciting and you know it really set us apart from other areas and we were frankly very proud of that and proud of the um, people who take care of each other in the community for achieving that so you know i think the city felt a little bit immune from opioid crises when was the prescription opioid crisis here in san francisco in general we think of the prescription opioid crisis as maybe the first 12 years of this millennium you're saying that the community in San Francisco, and that includes other people who are using also public health officials, et cetera, worked together in such a way that we were able to prevent death to an extent. Yeah, there was overdose prevention programming in San Francisco that started, it started underground in, in the late 90s, and then uh, officially supported by the health department as of 2003 with the DOPE project, the Drug Overdose Prevention and Education Project, which was the first of its kind in terms of something supported by a health department. It was really associated with uh, supporting the community to support each other. The work though of reversing overdoses, that's done by almost entirely people who use drugs um, and their friends. How do they care for each other? If you think about it, who's gonna be there when somebody overdoses? The most likely person present is going to be somebody else who uses drugs. And it's no small matter to save somebody's life. And many people out there in our community have saved dozens, if not hundreds of people's lives with naloxone reversals. There's a lot that goes into that. And I think some trauma that goes into that, much like, you know, our paramedics experience the trauma of saving lives every day in their job. You mentioned that we'd done such a good job with each other for the for the past 20 ish years that we felt a little bit immune or we felt like we had it covered so what's going on now well fentanyl changes the game for all of us even communities like vancouver that had supervised consumption sites and lots of extensive programming when fentanyl came they were wiped out by it with huge increases in mortality so we suspected that when fentanyl really came and hit, if it did come to dominate, we we were going to be in trouble too. Because basically nothing that we can do for overdose prevention works as well for fentanyl as it does for heroin and other opioids. The psych naloxone distribution is kind of our primary model of overdose prevention. If we are distributing naloxone, we're getting it out to almost everybody. Let's say we're getting naloxone out to almost everybody. The mathematical models would suggest that we can prevent maybe a quarter of overdose deaths. Now, when we transition to fentanyl, we have a drug that is maybe 50 times more potent than heroin and that is causing overdoses about two and a half times more often as heroin. And we know that these overdoses are about twice as likely to result in death compared to a heroin overdose. So how does naloxone work and why is it different with fentanyl? The naloxone distribution intervention relies upon bystanders administering naloxone. So there's a certain window of time that you have where you can give naloxone, it will reverse the opioids and the person will wake up. That window for heroin is thought to be somewhere between 30 and 90 minutes. So that is to say, if you just used heroin and I just used heroin and I wake up 25 minutes later and you're turning blue and I administer naloxone, you're very likely to wake up and be fine. The reason is because it takes a while for an overdose to occur and for it to result in cardiac arrest. I'm trying to treat things before cardiac arrest. And with heroin, breathing kind of slows slowly. So we normally breathe 12 times a minute, you use heroin, you drop down to eight, 
that's fine. You get down to six and it's getting a little risky. You get down to four, your carbon dioxide levels going up. You get what's called CO2 narcosis where your brain's not really responding. If it gets too far, you're not gonna respond to naloxone and eventually your heart's going to stop. So we have at least 30 minutes to respond for, with a heroin overdose. Fentanyl, in contrast, it works much, much faster. So within seconds to minutes, somebody's breathing can stop completely from fentanyl. And when that occurs, then you're just counting down the minutes until cardiac arrest hits. So I would estimate, I don't have good numbers on this, but my estimate is that you probably have about five to 15 minutes to respond to a fentanyl overdose compared to 30 to 90 minutes to respond to a heroin overdose. So what that means for a bystander intervention is that it's not going to work as well. The problem is getting that naloxone on board quickly enough, especially if the other bystanders are also high, right? So you have to wake up from your nod to help your friend. So one of the things that we strongly recommend is staggering use. Um, so, you know, we don't use at the same time so we can make sure each other is safe. That's a, a critical intervention to try to help make the naloxone intervention still effective. How do you administer naloxone? So naloxone is uh, an opioid blocker. So what it does is it binds really strongly to the opioid receptors, knocks all the other opioids out and uh, reverses the toxic effects and desired effects of opioids for about 45 minutes to an hour. And it is usually administered uh, either intranasally with a little nasal spray or by injection. How are people becoming addicted? Um, how, you know, what are the mechanisms uh, by which people are getting hooked on fentanyl? But what's going on in San Francisco where we're seeing an uptick in, in, it, in it addicted uh, residents? This is part of a, a national phenomenon and a national opioid crisis. And so some of this is people who have gotten hooked on opioids, uh, you know, elsewhere that have come to San Francisco. Some of it is within San Francisco. And if I can sort of take a big picture view of this, one of the real drivers of addiction is sort of social determinants of health. So if you think about the opioid crisis in the United States, um, the prescription opioid crisis, biggest epicenter of it was Appalachia. And what happened in Appalachia that led to the prescription opioid crisis? Fundamentally, what happened was economic abandonment in the 1980s. So that whole region of the country had no job prospects. And then that in combination with the over prescription of opioids led to that region being prescribed massive amounts of opioids and, and really getting hooked on opioids and not looking really any different from uh, an inner city, uh, very poor neighborhood that has limited economic prospects and a higher risk of developing um, problematic substance use disorders. I guess the simple way to say, you know, poverty, economic inequality, racism, these things are some of the social determinants that influence or increase uh, rates of addiction and problematic drug use. For additional context, when someone's facing poverty, when someone's facing racism, how would you describe the reasons that they turn to drug use? And I, I might theorize that they're feeling frustrated, they're feeling kicked back, they're feeling uh, helpless, uh, and they're looking for a way to sort of numb the pain. Am I, is that how you might describe the pathway toward this type of drug use? Yeah, I mean, if I could remember the exact quote, I'd, I'd use Lenny Bruce. Um, you know, op opioids, they, they really do help to numb the pain of life. Life is really hard, and for some people, particularly people that are facing some of these uh, obstacles, the pain it can be really, really hard to make it through. And uh, opioids and sometimes certain other drugs, um, they can really help people to tolerate day to day. The problem is that the long term consequences can be really serious, but in the short term, at least, um, it's a way to to survive for another day. You hear people talking about overdose and there's this sort of push and pull or this tension between it's the fault of the addict versus it's a public health crisis and we need to treat it as 
as something that needs an intervention and needs care. What might you say to someone who comes from the perspective of, well, people have a responsibility to take care of themselves and they and they did this to themselves? How might you respond to, to that? As we talked about, the reasons people end up in a, in a situation with a, with a use disorder are driven largely by social determinants of health. You know, that's not to say, though, that wealthy people don't develop uh, use disorders as, as well. I mean, wealthy people certainly use drugs, they develop use disorders, and then they go on to star in blockbuster movies and be really successful because they have the resources to be able to um, care for themselves and and work through serious disorders. And that's that's wonderful. I wish that was available for everybody um, to have the, the financial and the social capital to be able to uh, help people work through these problems. You're listening to News in Context. I'm Gina Valeria. We're talking with Dr. Philip Coffin, Director of Substance Use Research at the San Francisco Department of Public Health, about the impact of fentanyl. I generally describe addictions kind of like I describe type 2 diabetes, and I'll use my father as an example. He ate a lot of donuts in his life, and he had a genetic predisposition for type 2 diabetes and was very overweight and didn't exercise enough. And uh, he developed type 2 diabetes, and his providers treated him with the appropriate medications, and he never got his glucose, his sugar under control. But he was given all the vaccines and all the cardiac protection medication and all the other stuff and all of the expensive care that you need. And he outlived his father by 16 years because of all these interventions, even though he never got his donut habit under control. And I am so grateful for those extra 16 years I had with my dad. And I wish the same for everyone else who has somebody who has a substance use disorder. Even if they can't get that substance use disorder under control, there are things we can do to help them be healthier and to support people in living longer. That may seem a little bit superficial because a donut habit isn't as harmful to the family as as a drug habit might be. But there's a little bit of a correlation and those of us, those who have lost loved ones to um, overdose death uh, know how horrible that pain is and how much we wish they were still there. I appreciate that. Having these conversations to try to make these connections is something I appreciate you taking the time to do with me. So let's go back to what might work. And I guess I want to talk about, you know, both what we're doing here in San Francisco, what you're advocating for, and also strategies that have worked elsewhere in other parts of the country and other parts of the world that have helped um, either save people's lives in the moment or helped with the addiction challenges that they face. In the setting of fentanyl, opioid deaths have increased from uh, about 120 a year to about 480 a year, so about a fourfold increase. We think that without naloxone, they would be around 550 for the opioid deaths. So we're still preventing at least as many, if not a little bit more of the deaths, but it's a smaller proportion for the reasons that we talked about. Um, So that is disappointing. You know, if we stopped doing naloxone, we'd see another spike in mortality, but it's not, you know, it's kind of not as satisfyingly effective as it used to be. Um, The same goes for our medications. So we know that methadone and buprenorphin, our medications to treat opioid use disorder, are really effective at reducing mortality. And they're also really effective at improving people's lives, uh, decreasing illicit income, uh, increasing housing, increasing contact with friends and family, increasing employment, you know, increasing all the things that we want to increase and decreasing the things that we are concerned about. These interventions are not working as well in the era of fentanyl. They still work, just not quite as well. And there's a couple of reasons. The primary one is that fentanyl is so potent And these other medications are just not as potent. And I'm going to get on methadone and and it's not going to be strong enough compared to what I was getting on the street. So the drug's so strong on the street, that enticement to get into uh, a program or on other kinds of treatment is lower. And then with buprenorphine, which is our other medication, and there's a regulatory difference between these. Methadone, you can only use for treatment at a methadone treatment program. 
buprenorphine, any medical provider can prescribe. And you pick up at a pharmacy and you're treated, you know, just like my dad was with his insulin, which is fantastic and wonderful. And you don't have to go stand in line with a bunch of people who are using drugs and be tempted to use drugs. So you have that independence and you're treated like you should be in the medical system. The problem with buprenorphine is a little bit complex, but to start buprenorphine, you have to lower your tolerance to opioids enough that the buprenorphine won't send you into withdrawal because buprenorphine has a ceiling effect. So if you're on this high dose of heroin, you stop using for a day, your tolerance goes down, you start buprenorphine, you feel a little bit better and things are nice and smooth and it goes great. With fentanyl, your tolerance is so sky high. You can stop fentanyl for two days and be in horrible withdrawal and you start buprenorphine and your withdrawal gets worse because buprenorphine is so much lower than the fentanyl level. So we've been developing novel strategies for that, something we call uh, overlap initiation or microdosing. There's a bunch of different terms. But basically the idea is people continue to use the opioid that they've been using, which is usually fentanyl now, and they start baby doses of buprenorphine. And over three, four days, they replace the receptors. They replace the fentanyl with buprenorphine in all of those receptors as you slowly increase your dose and get up to a reasonable dose. So that's working better but we still run into the issue that the fentanyl is so good on the street, the temptation is pretty hard to resist. Reading about your work with pain management clinics, that some of them are closing. And also you mentioned earlier that there were some underground programs at the start that helped serve this community to prevent death. So I'd love to learn more about those programs and also what's happening now and, and what we're missing. There's sort of a national crisis where not just physicians, but uh, other clinicians as well, um, particularly in primary care, are just refusing to prescribe opioids. And this comes from what was really, frankly, a, a crackdown on opioid prescribing, not just the guidelines to prescribe fewer opioids, but then things like investigations into people uh, for prescribing opioids that weren't just these pill mill investigations, but based on, let's say, a single overdose death, providers being investigated because they had prescribed opioids once to somebody six months before they died of an overdose. Every investigation like that means you have to contact risk management. And if you're an individual provider, that's going to cost you at least tens of thousands of dollars in legal fees. And so lots of providers have just stopped prescribing opioids altogether. And in many cases, will refuse to accept patients that are on opioids, or they, they may accept them, but they won't prescribe them opioids. So what that means is you know, we have millions of patients around the country who have been prescribed opioids for decades. And we know very well from data that if we just cut them off, there are much higher rates of mental health crises, overdose deaths, and suicides. And particularly with fentanyl on the street, we also know that some people will transition to non-prescribed opioid use, which means street opioids. So the risk is sky high for patients if we are discontinuing them from opioids unilaterally. So that becomes an issue in places like California. It comes to the fore when pain clinics are shuttered. For example, uh, the LAGS clinics, uh, pain management clinics that cared for 20,000 patients for pain management alone, that shut their doors in May and led to a number of patients hopping from emergency department to emergency department to try to get their refills on opioids because they couldn't find a provider who would prescribe them. I see this as really disgusting. You know, if you think that prescribing opioids was problematic and we caused a terrible problem as a healthcare system, then we as a healthcare system have the ethical responsibility to manage the fallout of that, whether that's continuing to prescribe opioids for those who have become reliant upon them and can't do without them, or managing the use disorders that emerge from the prescribing. I don't see it as very different from a, you know, a surgeon leaving an instrument inside a body during a 
surgical procedure and then, you know, refusing to care for the patient when they show up for help. It's our responsibility to deal with that on both sides. Now, I have to say, I understand providers' reluctance to do it because of the regulatory crackdown. But we are seeing a reversal of that regulatory crackdown. California Department of Public Health and the Medical Board issued statements saying you should continue opioids when you inherit patients, you know, and work with them towards transitioning care that is uh, patient-centered. And the CDC new guidelines are finally coming out that say essentially the, the same thing, that you really shouldn't discontinue opioids in that circumstance unless there is a critically urgent need to do so um, for patient safety purposes. I want to say I appreciate your analogies. Like you see it as analogous to leaving an instrument in somebody in surgery. Like those are powerful and really helpful. Helping the public understand is, is one part of this. But what can we do to help this situation? What can we do to contribute to a solution? Some of the other things that, that have been tried include things like the safe consumption facilities or overdose prevention sites, places people can go and be safe. In places like San Francisco, the most important thing we need is just places where people can be. In the Tenderloin, we used to have more drop-in centers where people could go and could be, could spend the afternoon and be safe. Those were all shut down. Starting to see some reemergence of spaces where people can be is really, really important. And it's important on so many fronts because it means that people are safe and it means that the community is less bothered by certain activities happening on the street. So it's a win-win. Um, so I, I think one of the things the public can do is you know, support things like the Tenderloin Linkage Center and the efforts to find places for uh, people to be Say. On the journalism side, which is kind of where I come from, when those spaces are called overdose sites or, or needle sharings, the public sentiment or support goes down. But when you call it pain management or overdose prevention, public sentiment goes up. So that that verbal framing can play a role in how the public responds to to those spaces. Another thing I would I, that I would love to see um, would be greater options for treating opioid use disorders. In most of the developed countries around the world, there are other types of treatments available. Uh, for example, Canada has long-acting morphine, they have Dilaudid, they have heroin prescription programs. They have a whole bunch of different options for treating people who don't thrive on the, on the options that we have available here. We're hamstrung by federal uh, rules on that one. So it's a work in progress, but you are fighting the good fight. You asked what public can do. And, you know, we do have deaths as well from people who goes out on the weekend once in a while and think they're using cocaine, but they're using fentanyl. We're definitely seeing these. Might be as much as a quarter of our deaths. So the biggest thing I can say is, you know, anyone who accesses any drugs that are not prescribed through the traditional route should have naloxone, should be aware of the risk that what they're consuming could be fentanyl, and should make sure that somebody can help them if something happens after use. I can't emphasize how important that is. You don't see a lot of heroin deaths in, in youth. Most heroin overdose deaths happen when people are in their 40s or 50s. But fentanyl, we see more deaths among youth, and some of these youth are, are not intending to use fentanyl. That's an easy population that we could impact by really raising the awareness of this concern. Thank you to my guest, Dr. Philip Coffin, Director of Substance Use Research at the San Francisco Department of Public Health. Music in this episode includes Spring Fling by Track Tribe and The Heist by Silent Partner. In addition to hearing news in context every Friday at 8.30 a.m. and 6.30 p.m. on KSFP 102.5 in San Francisco, you can hear it on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, iHeartMedia, Google Play, Google Podcasts, Podbean, YouTube, and PRX. We're also on Facebook and Twitter at News in Context SF and on Instagram at News in Context. And you can find links to all of that at newsincontext.net. I'm Gina Valeria. Thank you for listening.